Well, good day, good evening, good morning, good wherever you are. Um, welcome, bienvenidos, bonjour, uh, and just continued Happy New Year. Um, glad to have you here today for our post-inauguration Cultivating Voices live poetry and our final new books showcase of January. Featuring poets book have come out during the past year during the pandemic. Uh, as I said, a continued happy and very prosperous new year. I'm sure many of you are still kind of basking in that glow of Amanda Gorman's inauguration day performance that uh, however, you there, it's, it's so interesting to have seen all the commentary about the strength of her poem versus the strength of her performance, um, the debate about spoken word versus page poetry. However you feel about that, I think I think all of us can agree that 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 her place and role that, um, on Wednesday placed poetry on one of the biggest stages for all of us to see its purpose and its power. And um, I think that's gonna serve us all well down the line. Well, I'm your host, Sandy Anone. Um, I'm the author of the book, Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. And I thank you so much for joining me and our wonderful poets today. Um, I'm here with you on location from Old Sabre, Connecticut. Uh, thanks to all of you joining us live in our Zoom poetry studio. And those watching us live over on our Facebook page. Well, today, it's my pleasure to welcome three poets whose work truly radiates in, in very different ways and at the same time in conversation with each other. Um, I really love this constellation that we have for you today. Um, Shira Dents, Jennifer Sweeney, and Jed Koretnik demonstrate daily how poetry is about community and how communities become stronger when they tap poetry for sources of inspiration and empowerment. Before I introduce our author today, I wanna to share with you a little bit about Cultivating Voices. Cultivating Voices live poetry began at the end of March, 2020 in response to the shutdowns of in-person venues everywhere. We were just talking about this um, before the program and has developed into an international, intersectional, intergenerational reading series and poetry community with now over 2,200 members worldwide. We alternate weekly readings between a live open mic where we have eight readers, 10 minute sets, uh, signups are on Thursdays and our new books showcase four readers set each um, by invitation, but members can request a reading. So if you have a book coming out um, in this in this year or within a within a year of the time we might book you, you are eligible to request uh, a reading. I'm booking now July through December of 2021. So just send me a message on Facebook or through my email. Well, we occasionally have a special event like our upcoming Laureate Love Fest on February 14th. So please double check our monthly schedule at the end of each week's event page. And uh, again, contact me if you need any further information. A reminder that next Sunday, January 31st is our final reading of January our live open mic and we'll have a sign up on Thursday for five readers and we particularly want to encourage new members who have not read with us. Well now to today's poets. I'll introduce each before they read and then return with a few announcements at the end of the program. The first reading today is, uh, is Shira Dance of a poet that I've had the pleasure to meet in person before uh, because one of her other books is was also published by Salmon Poetry and we were, I was lamenting her um, and grateful for the fact that she was one of the last people that, you know, I 
saw in person at P uh, in March of 2020. Uh, one of the last times, it was the last time I was live anywhere for reading. And uh, I was thinking about that a lot as we were getting ready for today's reading that, that I remember distinctly being in that book, in the book, in the, uh, in the book fair and seeing Shira on a number of occasions, um, did not knowing that that would be the last time I'd see poets in person for a very long time. Well, Shira Dents is the author of five books, including her new book, Sisyphusian from Pank, published in 2020, as well as two chapbooks. Her writing appears widely in venues, so poetry, American Poetry Review, Cincinnati Review, Iowa Review, New American Writing, the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series at poets.org, as well as being featured on National Public Radio. You can find more about her writing on her website, which I will be putting in the chat. Would you please join me in welcoming Shiretz? Thank you so much, Sandy. And I uh, guess it was the last time I was in a public place uh, where of a community of poets as well in March. Little did we know what was in store for us afterwards. Thank you everybody for coming today. And, um, and so I'm going to be reading from my new book, Sisyphusina. So we're all familiar with Sisyphus and um, I believe in equal opportunity. So I had to make a Sisyphusina. Um, so this book is, is hybrid and it's centered on female aging, which is a subject that uh, doesn't have as much exp artistic expression as male aging, which has a lot. And, um, and femininity is often closely identified or uh, yeah, measured and identified uh, with beauty, values of beauty. So for instance, uh, there's a very big business selling uh, wrinkle creams to even 17 year old uh, young women. Uh, and, um, and so anyway, so on the image of a rose, it has been identified with uh, uh, femininity uh, far back as, as far, like Roman de la Rose, the, the rose is a woman. And, um, and so the image of a rose recurs throughout uh, and uh, the uh, notion of beauty is something that I am uh, challenging in this book uh, through its formal construction. Formally, it's inconsistent, it's asymmetrical, and as I said, it's hybrid poetry, prose, and visual elements. There's also a collaborative element in here. Uh, I collaborated with, uh, with a few artists, visual artists, and also at the very end, uh, there's a QR code, which will bring you to a musical composition that Pauline Oliveros, the musical composer, uh, uh, improvised for me for this project. Uh, and, um, and she called it uh, aging music. Um, so that's in here too. And, um, and the book also interweaves um, different aspects of female aging. So uh, a collective experience. So through media, advertising, fashion, uh, historically. Uh, so there's a, there's a piece on hair for instance, several pieces on hair, and uh, the animal kingdom, uh, and various artists so within the canon, uh, and also my own uh, autobiographical uh, uh, history, uh, because of course, uh, 
as a woman, there's your you, there's biological clock, and so one if one has had certain uh, traumas or uh, you know um, sexual abuse, whatever, uh, that is also going to uh, come to a head when it comes to uh, come to aging. So uh, so anyway, so there's all these different all these different things going on in here. Uh, and so uh, the first, the first piece that I'm going to read uh, is a Sisyphusina poem, and there are a few Sisyphusina poems in here. Sisyphusina. So tired, rock settling in back of my eyes. Bone particles of sand, plus flat, smooth black rocks, plus a waterfall equals a Zen garden. But not calm, immeasurably loaded. Flat, smooth rocks and a waterfall. Black vultures fly so high in Southern Africa, tradition says they see the future immeasurably and loaded like Dickinson's gun. A vista crawls through dugouts or, depending on the observer's position, pillows of gray static. Vultures fly high, want to sit this one out. Matter crawls through pillows gray. Listen to winds changing seasons winter wind, spring wind, summer's wind, fall. I want to sit, sleep the color of iron pressing in between. Wind, a new season, pause at tree branches. Vultures use gravity as a tool, dropping bones to the ground to crack open their marrow. Birds, a pocket of air. Breeze sloping cotton, birds sloping calm. Breeze alone percussive, alone more cotton. Clouds, lawn, the luminous noon, field shadow. A tittering quite pretty. Outside, rushing interior, luminous green cover, percussive. It's the rushing feels beautiful. Luminous distance, green time, like clouds of solitude, the well interior. The air, calm, percussive. Birds, that's air. Clouds, being of the past, tittering. Okay, I'm going to read um, two short poems. This is titled Seasoned. Not being authentically original moving. I should enjoy my nothing tree looking at other trees. I can become as change, or it might just be too laborious. Water is no color, it's period of time. Weather getting antsy now, the darkness and sparkles, because color is absent from influenced by other things. Then Amponderosa looks alike a sea creature because it is clear with leaves lapping. And 
And this one is Architects, uh, A-R-C-H-I-T-I-T-E-X-T. -I -I -E so Architects. Information wearing pink house slippers with another cloud or introducing it. Cloud on a cloud, it looked like, stop criticizing. A cloud pairing up the day with a sense of those pine branches. He was just so steady, simple as running water, for instance. World that I could take on all four branches. Water, how it mirrors. Interested am I? Okay, and so now I'm gonna um, change the, um, the mood a little bit, I guess. And um, and so now I'm going to read, um, I mean, those others were kind of prose poems, but these are a little bit more narrative, I guess. Okay, cabinets. I put away the things, all the amber containers, voices about the chairs, cat fur, not exactly auburn, but wood color. Too bright, someone utters. And again, I want to close my eyelids. Yesterday morning, I had a strange dream. My father's arms and hands extended out of my shower wall instead of the shower stalk and head, reaching to grab me and pull me in behind the tile. It was dark back there, that's all I knew, in abyss and him. Then I thought, there's nothing to be afraid of. These arms are in my imagination. I can make them go away, concentrate. I had had a lot of practice at this, in the dream that is. This was part of my history. I succeeded victorious for the first time, but I knew they were going to sprout again like hydra heads and panic, terror renewed. I was bound to get thrown off and wouldn't be able to steady myself to thread the needle, so to speak, again and again. I wanted to phone my therapist, tell him what had happened, for him to encourage me that I could make his grasps disappear on and on. But my phone screen froze. Suddenly, an office in my apartment existed outside my bathroom, and everyone who worked there was either gone or leaving for vacation. I wanted to run out outdoors for help, but was in my skimpy summer pajamas, and it wouldn't be decent, even though I was desperate. I didn't want to act unselfconsciously because that I knew from experience could result in being prey. So there I was again in the familiar here nor there. If I had a drawbridge in my mind, it lifted and my thoughts couldn't cross to meet each other. If I had arms inside, they were flailing, waving. Birds trilling again, whistling. One could feel at one with wind, its motion. Okay, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read uh, this one, which is kind of a, um, a partner to the other one and they, they do appear next to each other in the book. Who's afraid of their father? That's the title. It's marvelous to be able to tell the difference between a nectarine and a peach. Skin, smooth or crepe, pastel or crayon. I was in charge and suddenly saw that the pet cat all the while prowling around was actually a tiger. Red stripes sizzled in my gut. All along in the background, I had been nice to it, but the very next moment, it had my hand in its mouth. Maybe those red stripes 
that had flared inside had slowed me down, buzzed his heat. I yanked my hands away, trying to be boss, became tougher around the house, edgier. So I didn't sweet talk it all the time. It needed to be sweet talked all the time. The group of which I was in charge, though we had never met in any tangible medium, decided they'd had enough. This was a turn in the story that I mind read. They didn't like the low level aggression they had to live with now. Who wants to live with tension? I was replaced, packed my belongings and left without any fuss or fanfare. Background was, this was custom. I wanted to see the world through my own eyes, not so simple. Roots again, trunks. The tree out there looks like a strong and noble beast with its bunched willows nodding in the wind like horses' manes. A mound, a knot, to ring mournfully. Nell, the knoll of a tree, navel, circularity. My mother and father voices buzzed like bees. I don't have to stay coiled to the beginning. Veil, see-through. The sound happens when wind blows through tree branches. Frequency, vibration, sound. Wave changes at texture. Leaf branches are fans now. That's the way they're moving in this particular wind and wetness. Okay, and I'm gonna close with another Sisyphusina poem. Hope everybody is doing okay out in Cyberland. Okay. Sisyphusina. Very eye of flowers, wisps arching, extreme weather ever that I'd be like the world and give them fructose syrup. Honey from their hive and ghost dancers, flowers black and give the night. How there's still room for doubt about bees honey from their hive, light as lace. Do you think looks matter? Over half billion people can't afford vision correction. Look. My body, guilt and confusion. People can't afford visions in me, Sisyphusina. Ghost has a verb, noun. The ghost has a verb, noun. Beauty blossoms with age. Ghost, beauty blossoms, wisps are with age. I guilt as lace. Beauty blossoms with a verb, noun. Ghost has a verb, no escape. Rose is a familiar place, a repeat female. O oh, verb, no escape. O oh, verb, noun. Rose into leave. Rose body, white wisps, rose into the lace, white with age. Ghosts arching to leave. Rose is a verb, noun. Rose is a Virginia Woolf voice, female. Ghosts are white wisps, arching like dancers, light as lace. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Shira. Uh, just really extraordinary. I love the versatility of your work. I, I, I just truly marvel at all the different places that you can take a poem. Uh, it, is, it is really your hallmark um, as I've been getting to know your work over the past few years and I read it in the journals and um, oh, I, oh man, just so fantastic. And the cats that lurk in your poems. I love those too. <laughs> the beauty that blossoms with a verb, noun. Thank you for all those verbs and nouns today. Thank you very much, Sandy. Oh my gosh, wonderful. Well, folks, this is what we have um, come to really be able to appreciate, enjoy, and dare I say, expect when we get together every Sunday is, is to hear work like you've just heard from Shira Dance and, and her, her, from her fantastic, um, I, and I literally mean the word fantastic collection. I love the cover too, um, Sisyphusina. Um, continue us with Jen, and I look forward to the next time I get to hear you read from it. Well, we move from upstate New York over to, all the way over to the coast of California for our next reader. Um, I'm so happy to say uh, one of the joys is finding the, the little connections that people that, uh, you know, I have with people and, and we happen to have a bit of a Nebraska connection from where she's published this, her, her, her latest collection. And it's been a real joy to um, be in contact with all three of these poets as we were setting up the reading. Uh, I'd also like to add, I really uh, enjoyed the conversations. Jennifer K. Sweeney is the author of four books of poetry, most recently, Fox Logic Fireweed, which was winner of the Backwaters Prize from Backwaters Press, University of Nebraska. Her other collections are Little Spells from New Issues Press 2015, How to Live on Bread and Music from Perugia Press, and Salt Memory from Main Street Rag. That's a, that's a, that's a pretty good list, my friend, Jennifer. That's pretty well done, I'd like to say. She is the recipient of many awards including the James Laughlin Award from the Academy of American Poets, the Perugia Press Prize, and a Pushcart Prize. She teaches poetry workshops at the University of Redlands in California and is known for a decade-long practice of private instruction and manuscript critique. Would you please welcome Jennifer Sweeney. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, I just wanna say Shira, that was so nourishing. It was an incredible reading and um, what a gift, thank you. And um, Sandy, Dawn, thank you for setting up such a warm space for poetry. Um, we all really appreciate it. I'll be reading from Fox Logic Fireweed, which is the, the newest book. It came out in um, September. And um, the poem kind of moves through five terrains. Um, and sometimes those are physical spaces and sometimes those are more emotional spaces. Um, so we kind of go through floodplain, coast, desert, suburbia, and uh, kind of high mesa, high desert. I'm gonna start with the last poem in the book. Um, at this point, nearly a year into the pandemic, um, it's fairly universal to find in some way that your life has been spared. And so this poem kind of touches such a gravity, a, um, a gratitude for being here and sort of the miracle of just keeping on. Ceremony. I laugh in my sleep and wake to my luck that there is coffee and it is warm and that I have a mouth is luck. 
the wet snap of air, empty bread box and paper mountains that seem never to erode, they are glorious. And when each evening a hawk too flies over the house, its shadow also along this oddly curved wall flies right over my head. In some bright city, I have quietly escaped my death without knowledge. Time I did not stop for the sunset or did. Having lingered too long at the wedding because I did not know how to leave. The procession passed by and devastated no one, but left the shadow of one granted bell after another. Skin of an orange, salvaged book, another web spinning in another unreachable corner. Um, this next poem has a bit of a backstory on it. Um, it's based on a headline, which is woman accidentally joins search party looking for herself. Um, so the story was a woman was on a tour bus in Iceland and got off at a road stop, changed her clothes. The rest of the bus didn't recognize her anymore and thought the whatever she was wearing before, that that person was missing. Uh, the woman knowing that she was not missing joined the search party unwittingly to, to find this person that was also her. And I just marveled at the story about how this is just kind of a great allegory for the human condition. We're all sort of in a search party looking for, for ourselves. Uh, so this is called, I will break into my life for my life. A woman on a bus a woman buying milk. You can go missing, whispering, certsy, your finger running across the map's lava fields. To fade into the measure of daily noise, sometimes a relief, unbecoming, sometimes a spill, bleeding out. A volcano in winter, strange birds everywhere. Certsy makes your hands tender things in pockets. Praise watching a man in a foreign post office threefold a letter and shimmy it into the envelope. Praise the clarity of running a brush through hair at a road stop. Running the hot and cold, which are both cold, you can go. Pulling at a shirt's loose threads. And over styrofoam coffee, a woman is gone. Everyone agrees. Hearing her story from a distance, you do not recognize the woman is you, and they do not recognize the woman is you. Who would not join the search? No one is sure of her name, but you hold its possibility in your mouth. You want to chase her out of the night. She has come a long way, and you don't want her to miss the flood, basalt, the delicacy of ash, you tongue in the air. This is a short lyric, crickets, vespers. Beyond the terribly bright and curious tender, we know what little and much the grass knows, God's in charge of wholly nothing, but to keep reaching toward all space, salt meadow, skin of the ghost wave rising. Keep the bandwidth of our chatter slow ever slow the rain falling into its own perception. There are more ways to listen than to weep. Slow the cricket nocturne, a human lifespan. Hear our voices sing back, angels in the field. Clock, clock, what have we come for? Um, you know, it's amazing how sometimes there are experiences that you have and you think, yeah, someday I'll write a poem about it, but it's just not ready. It's not time. It needs like three decades to steep before you can really sort of do it poetic justice. And so um, this one uh, is, is kind of one of those. Um, 
about 25 years ago, I was at Tassahara, Tassahara Mountain Zen Center, which is a beautiful um, practice center in the mountains of mid California. And um, so I was doing a practice period there of meditation and um, a few words you need to know the Zendo is the group the space where everybody goes in to do their morning meditation. And the Zen G is the Zen master who is leading the, the meditation. Um, so this is something that happened in the Zendo. Um, snake in the Zendo. Folded as letters about failure from the future. We are too serious in our attempt while facing, arranging small pillows with mudra hands. Grace is not practicing being graceful. It's emerging from the scrim of every discomfort with greater discomfort. Once I wept in my car and a woman knocked on my window then held me in the gray parking lot morning. It was not extraordinary, but when I grip the steering wheel in terror, I see her hands reaching toward the glass. Make everything part of the practice, the Zenji says. Blue Jay that swipes your toast, cleaning toilets in the guest house, forest fire sweeping down the valley, the monks rush to meet unraveling their black robes of fire hose. Until the sobbing starts, a woman in the corner whose body shudders whole each, each grief shock and wave. Collective we, great erasure, do we imagine we are shouldering her grief in a silent and beautiful gesture? Or are we trying so hard to do something right we have surrendered compassion in the stone of the Buddha. The Zenji's reed snaps its mindful warning against the wood floor as the woman sobs the meditation pre-dawn into day, our eyes coolly down. And the morning after she left, a snake slid its copper into the Zendo between us wall facing so dutiful. Some kept sitting, though most shrieked, ran out. Oh, we passed our judgment around the breakfast table after with talk of koans. I let the jay take the toast from my mouth like spitting out sacrament. The snake could have been a metaphor, but it was also a snake. Blood in the lotus, we were trying so hard in our unhappiness and the mountains were beautiful, crumbling under an opera of fire. If there was anything to hear, keep afraid what is fearful, hold what demands to be held. Um, this next poem is, it's a little lighter, a little shorter. It's a dance between the writer and the page. Um, this little tango here. And the poem is called Duet. Begin with five words. Chicory, sock witch, matterhorn, burrow, sticks. I stretch them across the flat line and wait for a spark. And if this act of listening is useless as standing in a field inventing doors, then come, my little failures. Meet me in a gift shop in the middle of nowhere, where cheap clock hands spin circles of air. Let me cradle you in the cold disk of a hot pink seashell. Slip inside your rickety wooden shoes and charm no thing and it's counter thing. I have no strings, I have no fire, but I can sit roadside for hours watching the hawks chase the crows. Who says habit isn't original? The wet eye, the being, it's small measure of daily noise. Hum and the grass trembles.
I'll read a, a poem for my uh, my Jen sister who is sitting over to my left. I don't know if uh, she's on my left on her screen, but on my screen she is. Uh, so this is uh, this poem speaks to uh, the 859,000 Jennifers of the peak Jennifer era, um, which is a, a fascinating thing to me. Names have trends, but the more I read about the Jennifer era. Um, you know, they sort of swelled up. And then as a teacher, like I've taught for 25 years and I've never encountered a Jennifer student ever. Um, we were sort of clamped down as a tribe. So um, this is Jennifer's of the 1970s. We were part of a tribe, at least three to a class. You could scan a room and find us everywhere, swishing a hula hoop around our Jennifer hips. Enough of us to populate Fiji or Damascus. We orbited our own planet, the paisley atmosphere swirling as the bell bottoms tolled and the sky rockets took flight. Mirrored disco ball, each facet released another known in relation to the initials of our last names, latch hooked on yarn pillows, ironed onto the back of our concert gut shirts. Macrame belt, God's eye, we came out of a dream sickle, rained like corn husk girls easily wrapped into skirts at the church bazaar. Our decade was barefoot, tapestry, buttercup, lemon lime, rick rack, easy cheese. To be so abundant, bearing a name that everyone agreed was lovely, a triple note they wanted to repeat, I stopped hearing it. The swift hook of the J, little gem in the mouth, the soft fur landing. All folded in the envelope of the common. A Xanadu of Jennifer's, a roller rink of Jennifer's, a decahedron of Jennifer's. I could always see the collective of us unwittingly part of the ensemble, yet to be one meant we were also gifted an alter ego, a spray on leotard or chameleon foil lurking under our jumpers. I run into one of us now in yoga pants, maybe a child at the hip. We're tired, we've seen some things, but we're pointed toward the horizon. And sometimes a few of us still rise when the latte order is called and our gently wrinkling faces smile knowingly. Glitter wave we all came out of so decisively. We're the Fosse dance in the musical that gets revived in summer community theater. The cake still holding its layers in the rain. The silver moon boot that flares in the late October sky. So where I live in California, it's uh, inland, the Inland Empire, it's called. We're not really near LA. We're up against these mountains. We're in the same um, county as the Mojave Desert, but it's you know still an hour and a half away from us. Um, and to, to kind of go out um, east from here, um, you go through an area called the San Gorgonio Pass, and it's just like a mesa that's filled with windmills. And so this one is called nacelle in turn. Um, I love that drive. And the nacelle is that outer covering of a wind turbine. Nacelle in turn. The windmills station the desert as though they have come here of their own accord. Sentience or indifference, they vessel and crank what exactly? 100 seasons in a field of quiet, the knowledge of machines restive and spun, silent noise of all that motion. The desert's question is always, what do you want to let go? Blanch and scree, the vista scoured clean, and you can tumble your guilt horse, darkest compass across the playa rear view. It will wear your leavings down to a howl. I want to believe in many things, health, justice, the moon, but all the wind moving invisibly, it would carve itself on the rocks if it could. To see it gathering, circle, 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 
is to see space flow, how inside the wind there is something else moving. I want to believe this is optimism, alien world. In the last um, section is subtitled In a Circular Wind and these circles keep coming up um, in this section. Something I sort of discovered after when I was arranging the book, these collection of poems that wanted to reach for um, the movement of circles. So I'd like to end with um, one that does that as well. This is for the brown widow who laid her eggs under my son's bicycle seat. Um, with a ceremony poem, it ends with that, you know, spider in an unreachable corner. So we'll go back to the spider here. For the brown widow who laid her eggs under my son's bicycle seat. You are searching the domed curves of shelter, a haunt of darkness to forge a pair of eggs larger than your body, anchor and parachute, wisp and captor. You cast your nets, cast and cast all directions, then time unspools before you. Under lip of flower pot, a lawn chair's crook against the weighted clangor of the chime. I've never sparted, spotted your starry orbs without your fiddle back, your hollow mouth parts perched in the filigree. How I've dug the stick in, crushed the papery shells into dirt, then pulled you through the wreck. My apology is thin. I don't know where to let you live. He practiced in the driveway. It only took a few yards before he found the midpoint, that precarious balance of belief in the center of everything. One foot pushes off and the other pumps back in divine symmetry. I took him out to the track where once he circled, he lit, purposeful, wind maker, looping the afternoon to dusk. How could the sky not have been an anthem? He wheeled, you held, the eggs spackled in their basket, feeling what of this world. Laying the bike on its side, we saw your sticky lair. He had reached under earlier as he propped himself on. Had we not dismantled, you would have continued through the mornings, the late afternoons, as, as he learned how to take a fall, a hill. You would have stayed until the breaking open your divine teal metal entrance. A wind here can take down a litter of palm branches, overturn the bottle, heavy garbage cans. But you, feathery mass of intricate making, remain on such silks beneath the highway bound car, the victor of a boy's lengthening body coming into its power. We head indoors and I'm sure you are more with us than we see, nestled in the stashed corners of our lives, mending. Under the arch of a 30 year roof built by whose hands? We survive beyond our knowing, all the wild and immersive gestures of the earth, too large for us to perceive. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I am just really appreciated all of the the ceremony i mean you started with sarah you know that gratitude this the ceremony of the ordinary like you made ceremony of everything and that those acts of listening which required me to perform an act of listening the little failures are your true genuine large successes within your poetry uh, i uh, really and of course capturing the 70s the jennifer 70s the bell bottoms you know all of it uh when i used to teach at the university of nebraska i would always 
teach in the, the first year composition classes, the first writing exercise I'd have them do to break the ice with each other and with themselves was to tell me a story about your name. And, uh, that's what, you know, because we all have some kind of story about our name. So I really, really uh, love, I really love that. So very much. And um, we've got Fox Logic Fireweed in the chat, the, the link. Folks, if you can, please, to the degree possible with your resources, purchase at least one collection, if not the trifecta that you could have today with our three poets. Uh, thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you soon as well. Come back and read soon. Well, our final reader today, as Jennifer told us, is a, no, is a gen, right? <laughs> they the sisters. Um, and uh, I, I just, I just want to say, uh, me here on Cultivating Voices, so many, how do I put it? Humble people who are doing stuff in the poetry community, creating community all the time. And, you know, we're not looking for the accolades or not, are, are not looking for the, yeah, are not looking for the, the limelight, you know, the, and I want to just say that Jen, Karetnik is one of those people in my mind who is that chop wood carry water of poetry, just just constantly adding to um, the significance of poetry and and holding space and particularly I get my daily significant dose of poetry from swim every day, which is one of her many endeavors that she participates in. Well, Jen Karatnik's fourth, fourth full is The Burning Where Breath Used to Be, David Robert book, September 2020. She's also now one of my salmon siblings, the author of Thing Hunger Until It's Pain, which is forthcoming from Salmon in spring of 2023. If we're still here on Cultivating Voices, we'll be getting you back for a new book showcase reading, I hope. In addition to collections. Well, among Jen's other awards and residencies, she has won the 2020 Tiferet Writing Contest for Poetry and has been an artist in residence in the Everglades. And as I mentioned, she is the co-founder and managing editor of SWIM Every Day. And I really encourage you folks to subscribe to that. I know we get a lot of things in our inboxes daily, but what she curates, you want to read. You really, it, it, it has sustained me many, many a day, many, many a day. So co-founder, managing editor of SWIM, Jen has been, Jen's work has been appearing recently in Barrow Street, the Comstock Review, December, Michigan Quarterly Review, Terrain.org, and elsewhere. She's based in Miami and works as a lifestyle journalist and is also the author of four cookbooks, four guidebooks, and much, much more. And we'll have all her information about you can, how, she can be in, how you can be in touch with her uh, in the chat. If I didn't know it better, I would have sworn you also had written, found a way to write a book about the Titanic in there too. I wouldn't be surprised. Would you please 
join me in welcoming our final reader for today from Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, Jen Koretnik. <laughs> thank you. That was such a such a generous introduction, and thank you for holding space for us. It's um, it's such a it's such a wonderful thing you do every Sunday. Thank you to Shira and Jennifer um, for those wonderful readings. And I do want to acknowledge that my swim sisters are here listening. Um, I don't chop wood all alone. I chop wood with Carrie and with um, Catherine and we carry all that water together. So I, there's no way I could do it alone. Um, programming all of that and choosing all the poems. And um, we have a community down here in Miami where we work together. And that's really what SWIM is all about, supporting all the women writers. Um, we do it together. So that's, that's the big part of it. Um, but thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to be reading today from The Burning Where Breath Used to Be, which is my fourth full-length book. And the main pillars of this book, the main themes are faith, feminism, and family with um, a little bit about chronic illness in there and aging. So I'm gonna try and touch on those main themes. Um, and I'm also gonna try and read some poems that I haven't really read from this book before. So um, it's gonna seem a little strange, I think, to me, um, but here we go. So the first poem actually is a poem I have not read from this book out loud. And it is about cats in a way. So Shira's poem reminded me that this poem is about a cat my daughter brought home a cat from college that she said was her cat. It is now my cat. It will become her cat again when she leaves for graduate school. He does not have a tail. He has a little bit of a tail. We don't know what happened to it. Um, sort of cants away. And the vet said it would eventually fall off. It did not fall off. Um, it is like a woman's arm. And when she brought him home at the same time, there was a spate of male writers who kept calling everything about a woman a Kimbo. And it just seemed to me um, in the feminism world that every time you describe a woman standing a Kimbo, you're just saying she's indignant and outraged. So I looked up the meaning of the word and it's not really what it means. So this is invocation for a Kimbo. For a rye, for a slope, for a skew, for shaped into a crook, for throwing an awkward elbow, for the handles of jugs and impertinent teapots, for sharp pointed, for bow bent, for the etymology of battle in common use, from Old Norse to Middle English as applied to spear, spike, dagger, goad, hook, anchor, ax, knife, sword, let us assign such a context to the weed of a kitten's tail seated in a car engine after the flowering of pistons and spark plugs, after the pluck of crankshaft, not a wound, but a weapon, not an amputation, but an argument, a stiffened extension of spine canted at a womanly angle, also meaning bold. This is a poem um, that I've read before about a pair of squirrels I used to watch from my former house, from my window. They used to groom each other. And it reminded me of another squirrel that I used to see on my daily runs. If you see something, stay camouflaged. Every day in the same crook of sapodilla tree, a weave of two acorn rich squirrels who font each other's tails matchstick ears free from mites. Down in my chair, I squirrel. I can only observe them if I pretend not to. Don't make eye contact through the spiderwebbed screen, the impact window. What I've learned about not watching squirrels, they are also good at the gaze just beyond, like colleagues at a party who would rather not greet or competitors at midfield forced to shake after the toss. These squirrels as attenuated to threat, regardless of barriers as migrants. Once running when I could still run Achilles tendons, 
not yet knotted like the chains of necklaces squirreled away in a bag together. Under the double baby stroller on the root cracked sidewalk while I bounced in place for a stoplight to green, a gouache hunch of squirrel froze as if for an art student to sketch. I thought at first she mouthed a coconut, but it was a kit. Her jaws stretched so wide over the fuzz of her fruit-sized squirrel fallen from its nest, she appeared unhinged, the way we all must look when we sense danger to our offspring, but we aren't quite sure if it is real, if we should act. Squirrely, I forwarded my babies through the sight lines of FUs, SUVs, heated breath at my hips. Gunned into motion after discharge from aim, I was also that saw something squirrel. So this is a question that I used to get my entire life until I guess I became sort of um, an older, uncaring grown-up um, in my 40s. Um, people used to ask me my, why my lips were uneven. And the truth is I got hit with a rock when I was 10. My parents um, who are listening also will remember this. Um, and it's kind of funny because after I read this poem for the first time, my dad called me and he says, I don't remember this story the way you just read it. But this is, you know, a little poetic license too, of course. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I don't care anymore about the fact that my face is crooked or that my lips are crooked. And these are the things that happen when you get older. You stop caring so much about your appearance. Or, I don't know, maybe you just look better to yourself. But this is the story about how, how my lip became crooked. You always play in the most dangerous places. Congressional complex. I could not sting like a bee or float like a butterfly, though I did learn to throw a punch from my trunk, not my wrist, after our father taught my sister. A shadow boxer, a flyweight, I followed her from the split level house to the little league where she was the first girl to play another way for the other gender to spend a lengthening spring afternoon. Formed from former gravel pits, the fields were shielded to the right by hills of shale and river rocks, rising over the stand of pin-boned pines we generously called the woods. We were warned away from here. Horses wouldn't be able to drag us out were we to fall under an avalanche of these stones. But no one advised a boy to not toss them as flirtations, which is how one landed on my lip. Struck dumb, it squirted into a bucket empty of baseballs that I brought home. Even after surgery, I swallowed his name like blood to wear the fist he made me for life. I think it was a little shocking to my parents that I actually knew that it was a boy who threw the stone. I'm not really sure what story I told them at the time, <laughs> but there were a bunch of boys throwing rocks. Um, and I guess we just protected those boys that did the terrible things. Um, this is another little story about a boy who did terrible things. My brother, <laughs> this is a golden shovel. Um, my brother was a naughty kid um, he had a club called the Daredevil Club that I desperately wanted to join. He never let me in. Plexiglass Suburbia. In the summertime, when the New Jersey humidity is so thick, it can be kneaded like dough. And there isn't much to do besides taunt and be taunted. Everything depends on making the Daredevil Club. Admittance is granted upon a feat of such physical audacity that even a Spartan, even a boy like my brother, cannot deny the legacy of red stippled scars it will surely leave behind, the wheelbarrow of flesh and courage that can be carted away in equal glazed measures from the site. My turn, at the top of North Ashby with a neon orange skateboard no one knows how to ride, in rain that has been falling for days, collecting in the potholes, the water rubicund with clay from half-built housing developments beside our cul-de-sac. 
In my imagination, I crouch and glide, but in the end, I sit knees to chest and cast off an unguided blur of white. It's no use. I arrive clean and whole to be cast down with chickens. And that, if you listen to the end words or could define what the end words were, was after the very well known poem, So Much Depends Upon a Red Wheelbarrow. Um, sadly, my brother is no longer with us. And I'm going to read a poem that I rarely read out loud. Um, there are a lot of poems in this book that I have trouble reading out loud. Um, I'm going to try this one. Take a little sip of water first. His birthday is coming up. And this one is a little tough. This is called To a Jewish Casket. The body inside you brings nothing but itself. Simply dressed, face up as if in repose, hands uncurled to show you that they take nothing from this world. Together, you will give back to the earth when it thaws, pause when it freezes, then resume. One day, many seasons from now, not even a handle will be left to hold you. Only bare bones, stripped of grudge, cradled like seeds of the conversation I have long since been denied. Oh, I made it through that one, okay. Um, this is another poem about faith or maybe questioning faith. Um, this one's a little bit longer. It's called For Urgent Prayer, Please, Please Press One. And it's about those robocallers that somehow get your name on a list. And um, yeah, we all love those. Um, this one got my name because my husband's last name is Cross and they think he's um, not Jewish, I guess is how this one happened. This one was after Hurricane Irma. So there's some homes in here about hurricanes and natural disasters, which if you live in Miami, you just can't avoid. Am I in need today? The Mercy Church robocaller from Marathon, epicenter where Irma slammed trailers and cars from the narrow loaf of land into marinas, like a waiter swiping crumbs from a table, wants me to admit it, to say yes. I have no more strength except in this pointer finger to leave my print on the keypad and unlock the rest of this message. I could complain that I have run out of Diet Coke, that the mango trees have forgotten that they already stretch with the fetuses of fruit and bloom for the second time, throwing particles of pollen into the eyes of the wind, that the old dogs can no longer sleep through the night and begin to whine at 3 a.m., that the pool has become a place for an iguana the length of a crop bearing branch to garnish with salmonella. That this is the year my husband and I both turn new decades and still sink, ankle shackled with debt. Or I could catalog our traumas, our long list of overripe injustices, the ways our bodies, bred Ashkenazi pure for so many centuries, have been past broken genes how we have rooted them in the Edenic soil, the kind that smells already like vegetables before you even plant anything of our offspring. None of this is as exigent as weather turned into spirals, as if on a child's etch-a-sketch, the rotting takedown, the invasion of biblical street rivers no prophets can split to cross. Afterwards, the mosquitoes infused with infectious disease laying invisible eggs in the cupped puddles of downed leaves and fronds. The family's homeless even as another hurricane season approaches. No, Mercy Church, I am not compelled toward the singular digit. And it's not only a matter of the wrong programming of surnames. It's more like I require two for reluctant prayer, for three for an indifferent utterance to Adonai, or even four so that I can unsubscribe from this service, push five to opt out for the rest of my life, or six if I am atheist, seven, agnostic. 
When my husband and I were engaged in meeting with a rabbi, we asked if he could replace the word God with energy. He ate for his reaction. Storms have mostly now to do with what we have done, how much worse they get depending on who or what we burn. Press nine for the inevitable, or if you insist, wait online for the operator. This might take a while. And I'm going to end, thank you. I'm going to end with a new poem. Um, since you are so generous to um, highlight all of the books that came out in 2020, I put together um, this poem. I've been writing, um, I've been writing a new book and it's very Ulipian. So I've been putting a lot of restrictions on myself. And a lot of the poems are abecedarians. And this one is an abecedarian cento. And I have taken all the lines from books that have come out in 2020 that I have bought from friends who have put out books. And actually there are 25 poets in here because I had to use Jennifer, Jennifer Sweeney's book twice because she uses Q and Z. So Jennifer will hear two of her lines. This is called, even the title actually comes from another poet's book. So Jennifer, you can listen for your two lines in here, but you won't hear them till the end, just so you know. Um, so one poem, you read the Jennifer poem for me, this one is for you. And it's called Future Humans Won't See This, an Abecedarian Cento for 2020. As for her children, she has already let them go. Broken shells flecked in gold. Could they be poppies? Some bright blurred orange flames draped in black crepe, knowing that everything she'd done had brought her to this. Forever, how it could fill the hand, the smallest green heron in the nest. In the stillness, home is a prison made of gingerbread, moving through it like wind in the dark alive, the giant jolt. New words for solace, one of which is knifed. Death is everywhere and pretends to be life. Truth seems ancient, surrounded by moisture, where loneliness languages, languishes in narrow beds. Down here, the eye is its own lantern, no answer from its flat gray face, pounding on the door she never used to lock. Quiet as knives on the spring punch street, the repetitor leads her through, spirits sparkling in communion and discipline. Every theory lingers in the cavities. Eventually, the undoing will cease, up there in a vacuum littered with satellites for seeing the whole world, wars and all. Aligned in a miniature xylophone, the failures, the losses, the broken path. Yes, it was splendid, that echo and echo, compost, onion skins, zucchini stumps, damp ribbons of peeled carrot. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure being here with you all. Wow, Jen, I... adore the generosity of the of the cento I just and how I, and what I was talking about about you and community it's so it's not surprise me that that is what you would do for t the poets of 2020 to, to to create that way to continue to lift them as you and your swim team do every day and the daredevil club well for better for worse you're carrying the legacy of it on now so brava to you sister brava to you folks how about we un how about we unmute and give shira and jennifer and jen uh our our appreciation 
for their fabulous reading today. I hope everybody can unmute. I don't know if they can. <laughs> I loved the alchemy of your reading. It was it was just it was riveting, and and the three of you are a bright constellation. Uh, I just thank you each uh, for your unique visions that intersected today in surprising places of womanhood and solidarity. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Thanks to Don Krieger, with whom none of this would be possible every week. He's in the background, I'm here in the, the screen. And as well as a shout out to my sister and co-founder Elizabeth Ann, with a reminder that we're gonna round out our first month of poetry in 2021 with our live poetry open mic Sunday, January 1st, same time as always, 12 noon Pacific, that's one mountain, two central, three o'clock on the East Coast and eight o'clock over in Ireland and the UK. And as always, just check your time zones. If you're joining us, we have a member today joining us from Austria, actually a Zoom room. Well, coming up in February, um, a, a, a really fantastic month of poetry because we're celebrating Valentine's Day and Black History Month, all February um, in the US. And we begin our month on, uh, with our new book showcase on the 7th of February with uh, Tamara Jason, Mike Yurkovic, Iris, Iris Gersh, and Carla Cherry. And on Sunday, February 14th, mark your calendars. Mark my word, mark our calendars. Now to receive your poetry Valentines with our Laureate Love Fest, co-sponsored with the Olympia Poetry Network and St. Martin's University, featuring poet laureates from across the US with special guest poets from Canada and Ireland and special video Valentines from US poets laureate Ted Kuzer and Joy Harjo. So be looking for that registration link soon for our Valentine reading. Well, my friends, that's it for today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you are. I'll be back next Sunday with y'all and look forward to bringing you more poetry from, from around the ecosystem, from my temperation in my, my parents' house in Old Sarah, Connecticut. Ahoy, friends, safe travels and keep writing. Thank you.